Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is, wherever you are right now. Thank you for tuning in to the Conversations with Dr. Don Show. This show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon area. Mm -hmm. and for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and about whatever it is we have decided to talk about tonight and talk about interesting people. My guest this evening, Jack Kerfoot, is here. Don, <coughs> it's a pleasure to be on your show again. How are you feeling? I feel very well, thank you. And yourself? I'm nervous. All right. How come you're not nervous? I've had a lot of practice going before <laughs> boardrooms before, uh, uh, so I've been on television quite a few times as well. We'll have, and we'll welcome to us. Now, you were on the show before here. Many times, yes. Many times, and each time you had to come back because you got more and more interesting as you came back <laughs> more and more. Well, I had different topics to talk about, yes, that's yeah. right. And yeah, the topic this evening is in uniquely interesting to me, and more than a, a, a plain ordinary topic, or an interesting topic. And uh, the title of the show is Jack Kerfoot's Fueling America. An insider's journey, and you are in, indeed an insider. Yes, that's right. I actually wrote a book, and it's called Fueling America: An Insider's Journey. Uh, it's my perspective of the real uh, oil and gas industry, which includes the high-stakes gambles for to find new reserves, corruption, uh, oil price volatility, and the impact of the volatility on the people in the industry and outside the industry, fraud, technical blunders, spectacular successes, and gut-wrenching failures. Um, I describe my interactions and my stories working with wildcatters, bureaucrats, potentates, ministers, doodlebuggers, sheiks and tycoons, uh, and my travels around the world in the quest to provide fuel for, to keep uh, America going, moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I must confess there's another, another association you and I have. Mm -hmm. We attend the same health club. That's true. And I'm so surprised to see you in a suit because usually you're either naked, uh, 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 <laughs> almost naked, or in your gym clothes. Well, hopefully I'm, I'm wearing appropriate attire from, uh, at the gym, but yes, I do enjoy working out. I always have. And I've admired you and like you and a whole bunch of other stuff, so if I sound a a little fawning, it's because that's how <laughs> I feel about you. <laughs> You're very kind, Don. You're very kind. Yeah. So, yeah. As you know, the show goes in two major parts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the bio part, the who are you part, is right. where I talk to you about who you are and where you came from and all kinds of questions like that. Right. So the viewers <coughs> get an idea who you are, so right. they'll know why it is uh, you have views that you do. Right. In the second half of the show, it's going to be talked primarily about the title of the show, the, uh, Fueling American Insider's Journey. So let's get started with the bio part. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, if I asked your best friend, who is Jack Kerfoot, what would your best friend say? Uh, most of my best friends would say uh, very driven, uh, very focused, um, tries to listen to different people's perspectives, um, and has a myriad of interests and a myriad of opinions, uh, hopefully informed opinions, um, but dedicated and focused and also a Christian. Mm-hmm. Christian, capital C or small c? Uh, capital C. Okay. I'm a humanist. All right. Is that that's, okay? That's perfectly fine. I, <laughs> I can't judge, Don. It's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> so when and where were you born, Jack? I was born in Shawnee, Oklahoma, which is in northeastern Oklahoma, in 1949. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a baby boomer. Uh, and then my father and mother moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, in the early 1950s. Uh, and Tulsa at the time was the oil capital of the United States up until about the 1960s. In the 1960s, the oil and gas industry decided to move from Tulsa down to Houston, Texas, because oil was being discovered and gas were being discovered and developed in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but when I was in Tulsa, it was a w wonderful place to be. Uh, there were museums, there was the symphony, even though the city was maybe just under a million people. Uh, very well organized uh, city, 
very low crime rate, excellent schools. Um, from that standpoint, it was just a wonderful place to grow up and, and uh, learn, and, and I grew up with some wonderful people. Uh, we had neighbors who were Cuban immigrants, and uh, we had people uh, from all across the world in the neighborhood that I lived in. Did you cause the increase in the crime rate? <laughs> well, I could have. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was no report that it decreased when we uh, moved into different neighborhoods, so I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> So anything significant about your cultural uh, heritage that's worth uh, telling the viewers about? Well, um, I think that, you know, what is significant? Um, you know, I, I do have Native American ancestry. Um, I am a Vietnam veteran, um, but I feel very blessed uh, to have come back from that war. And, but I always feel uh, empathetic and supportive for all veterans. Um, past, present, and those that hopefully in our future. Um, so culturally, I think perhaps the most interesting thing in my life is the ability that, or the opportunities I've had to travel around the world. I've lived in Islamic countries for over 15 years. It concerns me when I hear stereotypes about uh, people of the Islamic faith or live in Islamic countries. Um, and I've had a chance to travel all six continents uh, and meet a myriad of people and a myriad of cultures. Each one is very different, each one is unique, uh, and each one is special. Uh, not to say that one is better than the other, it's just unique and special. And that, I think, is one of the wonderful things about humanity. You mentioned Vietnam, mm -hmm. and there's something that you mentioned to me <coughs> in the gym about hearing helicopters, and there's no helicopters where you are. PTSD? Did you have any PTSD? I didn't have symptoms? PTSD, but there are certain sounds uh, and certain things that you that just stay with you. And I came back. I came back from Vietnam in November seventeenth, nineteen seventy, um, which is also the, my wedding anniversary, uh, or not nineteen seventy, but November seventeenth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started school in uh, January of seventy one. And in the summer, I had a summer job uh, working for Sun Oil in a refinery. And if you've ever been by a refinery, they can be very noisy. And because I was a freshman, uh, the only jobs that they had were roustabout. So what I was doing was painting a lot of pipe and painting, painting a lot of vessels uh, in the refinery. But again, you've got a hard hat on and you've got earplugs in. And the, young man who was another university student and I were painting away doing what we were supposed to be doing. And I just, something, there was a noise that I heard and I looked up and I pointed off in a direction and I said to him, in less than five minutes there will be seven helicopters, five to seven helicopters coming from that direction toward us. I'm going to guess there will be seven. There will be two Cobra gunships and five Huey troop carriers. And he laughed and he said, I can barely hear you talk. How in the world can you hear that, that sound? Um, and two or three minutes later, sure enough, off in the distance came these seven helicopters uh, from Fort Hood. Um, I didn't have any inside information, but there's a certain noise that a helicopter makes, especially uh, even in a noisy refinery. And that's a, basically, yeah. That's, yes, but it's a sound of usually safety and food and resupply. Uh, so it's a very important sound to, that'll always be recorded in your memory banks. Wow, what a memory. <laughs> so anyhow, let's talk uh, about your formal education. Mm -hmm. um, I, after uh, Vietnam, I came back and I started university uh, at Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, I completed a, a BSc in geophysics and I have about a another 42 hours of graduate work, but I've also studied law at Oklahoma City University and uh, attended, uh, studied business at Penn State. You've been all over the place, haven't you? Uh, I have, I, it's like a rolling stone. I, uh, I keep moving on, yes. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about your early employment, but you spent most of your working life doing what this book is about. Well, the book actually starts uh, when I first, before I went to, into the military, I worked on a seismic crew, and it describes uh, the travels on the seismic crew and uh, explains some of the colorful characters that I met uh, in, my, uh, in my journey working on the crew. And then the time that I spent uh, working uh, in university, and even though I had the GI Bill, I was still working. 
So working for different companies, trying to understand what specific area I wanted to go into, what type of energy industry I wanted to go into. Because when I started university, this was really at the beginning of the energy crisis. And the real alarm bells in the United States about the energy crisis was in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. And when the United States and a few other countries offered humanitarian aid to Israel, several of the uh, countries in OPEC put an oil embargo. So in 1973, for the members that are viewers that are out there that remember that far back, mm -hmm. there were long lines around gas stations, and it was a period I of high, high inflation, and it was economic turmoil. Um, so at that time, what had happened is, in 1940, before the start of the Second World War, the U.S. was the largest producer and exporter of oil in the world. By 1950, we'd become a net importer because of the automobile. And after 1950, we had become heavily dependent on foreign imports of oil. Uh -huh. So from my perspective, I thought when I was in university, I enjoyed science, I enjoyed mathematics, that working in the oil industry was an opportunity to serve my country because we obviously needed oil or reserves to uh, keep our uh, economy moving and keep the uh, vehicles moving in our, in our country. Sure. So, that started the career, and then uh, then I moved around in the U.S., and then I was in Canada, and then I was in Indonesia, and I was back in the U.S. I was in Indonesia twice, Malaysia once, uh, Australia, Oman, Turkey, um, the Netherlands, England, Canada, uh, and across the U.S. Uh, in a 40-year career. Did you miss one or two countries? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, uh, we, uh, I, I spent time in South America and Africa, East Africa and West Africa wow. on work. So it was a great opportunity to see, like I say, so many different cultures. And my wife and I both enjoy, enjoy travel, so when we're overseas, Instead of flying home, we always made a point to try and find a unique destination and see, meet a unique culture, um, whether it's in East Africa, South Africa, Africa, South Asia, Northeast Asia, uh, but try and see a different part of the world and a different culture and different climate uh, and to broaden our horizons. Well, we're going to have to have another show so you can talk <laughs> about your adventures in different cultures. Okay, <laughs> yes, that's right. So you have been involved in this for a, a long, long time. That's because I'm an old guy. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and you mentioned your wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've been married 39 years, and on November 17th of this year, we'll celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. And in keeping with our desire or enjoyment of travel, we're going to visit the one continent we haven't yet been to, and that is Antarctica, to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and uh, that we're going in January. Uh, of next year. Uh, so that's what our plan is to celebrate our 40th year of wedding. Is it going to be weird being in another continent where you're not pursuing uh, the interests of oil and extractive uh, industries? No, oh, no, not at all, because I've been in a lot of countries in Africa and South America uh, and in Southeast Asia on holiday and enjoyed the opportunity to see the different climates and cultures. So, uh. mm -hmm. And children. No children, just no my wife and myself. Children, you have any pets, animals? Well, we, my wife loves cats, so we've carried a cat around with us across the world, from to Indonesia, Malaysia, across the world in each of the places. That's so, rather unique, isn't it? Uh, well, pe people do take their pets with them. Uh, I think one of my more entertaining stories is um, the second time I was, I was in Holland and I was transferred to Indonesia, to Jakarta, and actually, no, I was in London. And London has very strict guidelines and regulations on pets. And so all the, the vaccinations and health care uh, on, the, on the pet cat that we had were well in order. It was a probably five or six inches of paperwork, which had all had been stamped and approved not only by the English uh, vets, uh, but also by the uh, Indonesian consulate. So wow. we show up in uh, Jakarta. And um, we landed, and so we put our bags on the uh, case, and then we got the cat cage, came around, we put the cat cage in with cat on the uh, cart. And as we started to go out, um, a young man in the uh, <coughs> immigration tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, please follow me. And he took me in the back room and he said, well, your paperwork for your cat is not complete. Mm. And I said, well, 
what do I need to make it complete? And he said 28,000 rupiah, which at the time was about $2.80, okay? <laughs> so I paid him the 28,000 rupiah. And uh, so we got back in line. And, and again, another person from customs tapped me on the shoulder. And this gentleman clearly had never missed a meal in his life. And he said, um, <laughs> He said, uh, we, we need to uh, levy a special tax on this cat, because obviously this is a very special cat. Now, mind you, the flight that we'd had from London to Jakarta was nonstop, and the seatbelt sign never went off. And so it was a very rough flight. And after 14 hours in the air, I was a bit tired, so I didn't lose my temper. But I reached out, and I grabbed his hand and smiled and said, congratulations, you've just bought yourself a cat. And I turned around. Now, my wife's eyes were double the size. And he came running up behind me saying, but, but, but. And I, so because he was go, trying to extort extra money, he, he made me a little irritated. So I sat down on the floor with him for the next two and a half hours, negotiating the, the price of the special cat fee down to 12 cents. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I paid him, got up, thanked him very much. We then got in line and went through there. You're a certified comic also, aren't you? Uh, well, that was, I was, <laughs> was not in a comical mood, but it, it was a interest, one of many interesting stories I've had in the travels so that, are, that is in the book, yes. You betcha. All right. Your political persuasion, you've done so much traveling and been to so many different uh, systems. Do you have a particular political persuasion now in your American uh, uh, creation? I, I think I would characterize my political party, and I'm registered as an independent. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain issues that I think are important. Um, I believe in free trade. I believe in a, a balanced budget, certainly reducing the debt. I believe in more a fair equality in the tax system. Um, and I believe in support for the military. Um, and those are basically, and I believe, make sure that you have an active government. Mm -hmm. So if there's one principle that I would really be supportive of, it would be term limits. Uh, for both the state and federal governments, um, for senators and congressmen. Term limits? Yes, absolutely. Why? Because I think at times uh, when people, I found in my career that when I've been in a job too long, you become a bit um, narrow in your thinking. And the original uh, the, uh, founders of democracy, the Greeks, thought it was very important that all people serve in government. and it was a shared responsibility and a commitment. So for that reason, I think term limits uh, have distinct advantages, and it uh, will help perhaps bring about more positive change than we've recently seen. Well, what do you think about the present government now? What do you think they think about term limits? Um, well, I'm not sure. <coughs> That's an interesting question. Um, that was something that President Trump actually said, which I was surprised about. Mm -hmm. um, there are those on both sides of the aisle that think that's a very positive thought. Uh, there are those who've been in uh, power for a long time, and of course the longer time that they are in power, then they are gain more influence on different committees uh, and therefore have more influence for their states. Uh, doesn't mean necessarily they have the best credentials to be on those committees. So from that standpoint, I think that would be another advantage. We would have the opportunity for more bipartisan uh, selection of people that have expertise in specific areas, or perhaps even perhaps not expertise, more interest and passion in certain areas, regardless of what that political issue is. How about a tripartisan system? Well, it's interesting. Um, when we talk about countries like India, India, they have I believe 143 parties. A lot of parties. Uh, they do. Uh, <laughs> and it does make building a, a, a consensus government more challenging. Um, but we'll see. We have certainly have had different uh, factions run before, but it's never gained much traction so far. But based on the strife that we have right now, the pr political turmoil, perhaps this is a time that, that a third or fourth party might uh, be more appealing to people. Boy, you're just well versed and so doing many things with your learning and traveling. Yeah. So, um, difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy, sympathy and empathy. What's the difference between those two? Well, um, that's your last testing question. Well, it is. Uh, let's see if I can pass your exam. 
Um, I feel because I've served in Vietnam, I can be empathic to certain veterans and some of the issues and challenges they face when they come back from combat or come back from the military to try and adapt to when I came back from Vietnam, we called it the real world, and many of us called it the unreal world after a period of time. Um, <laughs> sympathy, I've never been homeless, but I can certainly feel sympathy for those that are homeless and believe that's an important issue to tackle, not just to be sympathetic to them, but to help them uh, move from the streets into, uh, into homes and buildings and careers uh, and regain a life that they can have more control over their and for their families. I'm confused because I get an impression that you're a tree hugger and you're also a conservative, and uh, those two well, are going together. <coughs> well, you see, um, uh, again, it's it's ha being an independent. You have different perspectives about different of issues. Of course. Okay, memberships in political, social, or civic organizations, and you've got a long list of those. Can you think of a, a couple or three that would be of interest to the viewers in talking about our subject? Um, well, actually, at different points in time, I've been a member of the Sierra Club, and I remember when I was in university, I was interviewed for a uh, honorary society, uh, and they foolishly let me in. But um, and I was asked the question how I could be a member of the NAACP and the Sierra Club and think about working for an oil company. And yes. my first response was, the last time I checked, the NAACP was not boycotting ExxonMobil. Um, which was not well received, but that's all right. <laughs> but the reality is, if you talk uh, to people who've been in the oil and gas industry, you'll find that a, a very large percentage of geologists and geophysicists and engineers uh, definitely believe the importance of uh, renewable energy. Uh, what many people don't realize um, is that oil and gas is not a renewable resource. There's a finite amount of oil and gas and coal left in the world. And we've already seen the, the majority, the vast majority of the high quality coal been mined out. So right now what we see is that coal is more expensive to generate power with coal powered power plants than it is from generating power from wind turbines or solar or hydropower. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's happened over the last decade and the change really has been the the uh, coal company or the power companies have, have uh, had to pay basically buy a lower quality coal so it takes more coal to generate the same amount of power and their costs are going up because they usually ship the coal on the railroads and the cost to ship that coal because it's a larger volume has gone up so the overall cost for the coal has increased so now renewable energy is cheaper than coal um, now, when we get down to natural gas right now, because we have volatility in the oil and gas price, um, what we see is that renewable energy is as inexpensive to generate power as natural gas is. It doesn't have that volatility, and of course, it doesn't generate greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, we've got to recognize, in my opinion, and that's part of the thing, position that I have, is British Petroleum estimates that there are approximately 50 years left of economic oil reserves left in, in the world. Is that an exact number? No. But basically what it says is in two generations, three generations, we'll be looking at a extreme shortage of oil unless we start shifting away from oil and fossil fuel. Um, in which case then you're going to see the prices go up. And then of course if we look at the continuing increase in the temperatures, they would say there's another reason to do that as well. I think we're slipping over into part two. Well, we might be, but uh, <laughs> part of it has to be about why uh, someone who spent 40 years in the petroleum industry is an outspoken advocate for renewable energy. Yeah, well, memberships in political, social, or civic organizations, did you mention any of those that you belong to? Uh, the only, or, I mean, I'm a member of my church, Portland Christian Center. Yes. I'm a Christian, and um, that's where I spend a, a fair amount of my time uh, at that and doing Bible Study Fellowship, which is an organization, and those are the two affiliations I have the most time outside of the gym. Okay. Well, and you spend a lot of time in the gym, too, yes, I, I know. Yes, I do, yeah. yes. Uh, persons... Uh, from the past or alive today that you particularly admire or look up to? Any names come to mind, two or three of them? Uh, 
Uh, well, let's let's remove the uh, alive today. Um, if okay. If you look back in recent time, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, who led this country through out of a Great Depression uh, through the Second World War. Um, Martin Luther King uh, made a dramatic change peacefully uh, to amazingly with, with the uh, hostility that was put, he was thrown at him through the entire period of time. Uh, those are two people that really come to mind. I think Jimmy Carter is a very kind person and has done some very uh, wonderful work. Uh, I campaigned for him when I was uh, many years ago. Unfortunately, his, uh, his, his uh, results as president were perhaps not the best, but I think he's a very kind and a, a good Christian man. Yes, yes. We're in perfect agreement oh. <laughs> with your choices. Yeah. Okay, now let's just take a break here and then we'll go into the meat of why we're here. All right, good. Thanks for staying tuned. Mm -hmm. And for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like most of you out there, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind one of kind individuals, and about whatever it is we've decided to talk about tonight. And we're talking about uh, Fueling America, Jack Kerfoot's Fueling America, an insider's journey. So now let's get into the meat of the subject here. And we've got a couple of prompting questions that I asked you to give me because this book is just <coughs> fantastic. I got to show you the size of the version that Jack gave me to prepare for the show. This is before he published the, the main thing. So it was a, quite a, a chore, but I enjoyed every moment of it. So uh, you will enjoy the book, I'm sure, because this is a, a, a better version than this monster here. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so, yes. And that's one of the reasons I appreciate who he is and how he is and what he's about. So anyhow, shall I start off with what is the storyline of this book? Okay. Well, the in, uh, Fueling American Insider's Journey, as I said earlier, it's an insider's perspective of the real oil industry. And you are an insider. I am an insider. And I think that's important to point out because I, I did a study of 20, over oh, almost 30 books that were in the energy industry uh, on the topic of energy. Oil and gas, a broad range of topics of oil and gas, the utility industry, and renewable energy. That's a lot of books. Uh, yes, I read some, I read reviews, I read reports on the books, uh, dove into the authors themselves, Qu actually qu quite a bit of time on the authors. And what I found is the overwhelming majority of the authors who were writing on energy were journalists. And they were writing, their stories were based on either interviews or independent research. And in my opinion, I think it's very difficult to really get uh, insight. And they weren't uh, insiders. Uh, they weren't insiders, not at all. There, I found one person who wrote about wind energy, uh, wind turbines in particular, and he was the only one that had spent uh, his career uh, in the energy industry, and that was in the, the renewable energy sector. Um, so I think that gives uh, an interesting uh, a, a unique twist. It gives me a, a unique perspective. Sure. Because uh, unlike a journalist, I have technical backgrounds, I have expertise in risk analysis, economics, geology, geophysics. 
Um, and uh, the other aspect is the way I've told it is I'm in describing my journey in each of the places I go and at the end of every few years or actually the end of every chapter which typically was every two to three or four years I summarize what's happening in the world on the entire energy sector across the world. Across the world. Okay, so why did oil prices rise in the in the 1970s? Why did they fall dramatically from 1980, $38 a barrel down to $8 a barrel? Why did they ramp up again in the late 90s, 2000, dramatically ramp up into 2000, 2001? Um, why have we seen a surge in coal and nuclear energy and now a decline in coal and nuclear energy? And what drove the renewable energy surge that we've seen first, of, first actually in hydro and then we saw it maybe a decade ago in wind and over the last five or six years in solar? Uh, and I talk about also why the United States should develop an energy policy, a proactive energy policy mm -hmm. of re renewable, sustainable energy and why it's very important that we should move from fossil fuel to renewable energy. Wow. So you are, that's why you're an insider. And you have answers to all those questions you posed? I have an opinion that I've written about, and yes, uh, I think that, it's, that I've got the documentation and the supporting references in all my work, just like any good engineer would have, yes. And because you're so in such demand, it means that you have a, an excellent reputation and you know what the heck you're doing. Well, certainly I've, uh, I still get calls, even though I keep saying I've retired, I still get calls from friends who would like for me to come back. Um, but I, right now, between the book and the, the life I have, that's, that keeps me quite happy enough. Every now and again, I might go out and see if I could help someone uh, in a uni unique situation. But yes, yeah, so I've worked around the world in a lot of different challenging operating environments and a lot of interesting countries. Um, and actually some of the more challenging countries, the most challenging country I'd actually say was Australia relative to the Australian government. Australia? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, they had at the time, um, the problem with Australia, it's, it's it, of course, Unlike the United States, the East is heavily, uh, is heavily developed along the coast and the West, uh, particularly in Western Australia and, and Northern Territories, have a population. But the whole economies of the two areas are very different. Mm. Um, and so when I was there in 2008, 9, and 10, the price of natural gas in the eastern part of Australia was about a dollar a standard cubic foot which is on a BTU equivalent basis would be equivalent of, let's say, about six to seven dollars a barrel of oil, which was well below the standard price for energy. On the western part of Australia, in the western Australia, particularly Perth, um, they had developed their economy or their energy power not around coal like the eastern had, but around natural gas. And so they were, although they had enormous gas discoveries, they were building liquefied natural gas uh, plants that were going to super cool this and then ship it out for export, which would benefit the federal government. The problem is there was a shortage of gas for Western Australia. So the price of gas at that time was between $9 and $12 a standard cubic feet. So on a B2 basis, that's like having oil at over 60 or 70 or $80 a barrel. So we were trying to apply for a permit using the normal permit process. Um, in which case you nominate an area and then it goes to Geoscience Australia which is the equivalent of the Geological Survey in the United States mm -hmm. and then they say yes or no and then they may raise an issue about environmental issues and then if there are no issues they will then put it out for nomination and bid. Um, we, I went over there several times um, and met with Geoscience Australia and they were very supportive of this. We had, I had letters of support from the equivalent of what would be the Prime Minister of, uh, or Premier of uh, Western Australia, um, senators from uh, Perth, uh, who is now actually the Foreign Minister for Australia, uh, all supporting for us uh, for have this area to be nominated. And on top of that, we did an extensive environmental survey to demonstrate that there were no issues with drilling in this area. And wells had been drilled in this area before. So we went over there, and then I got a, a frantic call a week before the area was to be gazetted and the blocks would be hopefully have been nominated to say that 
the minister had decided that it was not, uh, they were not going to nominate this block. So I immediately went to see the premier for the state and, and also the senators who were in a different party than the party that was in power, flew over to the capital, Canberra, and I met with the energy minister whose background, she was not aware of the difference in the energy prices between Eastern Australia and Western Australia. She wasn't? She had, no, no she didn't. Her, her whole background had been as a lobbyist for Chevron. And the premier, the prime minister for Australia at that time, Kevin Rudd, had put her in that position because he wanted to make sure they could move forward with the LNG projects with Chevron, so they thought she would be the ideal person to make sure these big capital projects would move forward because it would mean more revenue for the federal government. But she had no real qualifications. So ultimately, <coughs> at the end of this, <coughs> she basically said, I really don't care. Uh, I have other things to focus on, and people from Geoscience Australia came up and apologized. And it took another four years before they finally uh, put this uh, license up there, and the people of Australia were paying extremely high utility prices as a result of this. So um, I found that the, probably the most frustrating uh, environment uh, to work in at the time. Hopefully the other environments weren't quite as frustrating as that. Um, they, they were not frustrating. They were, there were different cultural challenges. Um, when I worked in Indonesia the first time I was in Borneo, and uh, the technical person, uh, chief geophysicist for the National Oil Company of Indonesia, Pertamina, would come over on the weekends when we were over there six, sometimes seven days a week, working and uh, want to sit down and chat about just technical issues. And a very, not, very kind, very intelligent man, but he didn't have many people that he felt he could really talk to. So I made sure I always made time to talk to him, shared books with him, um, technical books with him about geophysics, um, and we shared many different ideas and discussed many different challenges. So that was, then I was transferred back to uh, Houston and that was in 1982, almost 83. And then I changed companies, <coughs> and they put me in London working New Ventures. And then 1985, I was uh, transferred and promoted to, back to Indonesia. Um, but I had, bef when you work overseas, you always have to get a work permit. So I had to submit, fill out this long, long form with document to the Indonesian government for my work permit and then I had to submit it to the U.S. Embassy. The standard operating procedure in, in Indonesia at that time was that it expected to take at least four months, but usually six months to get a work permit, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> you're, 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 most of your time was spent fighting the bureaucracies. Well, but, but what was interesting is I submitted <laughs> that, and three weeks later, I'm in London, and I get a phone call from my boss who's doesn't say, hello, Jack, how are you? His only words were, who do you know? And I said, I'm sorry. He goes, you've just gotten a work permit in three weeks. No one gets a work permit in three weeks. <laughs> and, and I said, well, it's probably less than that because it probably sat in the embassy or the, the embassy in London for at least a week. Uh, but I said, I have no idea. Uh, and it turns out the gentleman, Toto Sidero, who I met in Borneo, was now the head of geophysics for the uh, government, uh, the oversight government. And so he had to approve and review all the work permits for all the people that were applying for positions. And he said, oh, I know Jack. Approved. Okay. So again, uh, a <laughs> friendship. Talking about sucking up. You uh, know how to do it. Uh, well, I had no idea I was doing it at the time, but a friendship made at that time. Yes. And, uh, and it was important because he realized, and again, when American companies work overseas, unlike a lot of European companies or Asian companies, we must be, follow strict guidelines relative to not have any form of corruption. Mm -hmm. Sorbane's uh, 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 Foreign Corrupt Trade Practices Acts. And so that they, they, my reputation in Indonesia was uh, right by the book, no, no variance or deviation. And the only thing he asked me, he says, every now and again, I may be called in for a meeting with my superiors in Pertamina, the National Oil Company of Indonesia. And he said, I may need technical help. And I, and I said, well, you call me and tell me what you need and I'll get it to you. So it was a very professional, a, very, a wonderful uh, working relationship in Indonesia. And I have only the fondest memories of 
not only Toto, but in my time, both of my times in Indonesia at that time. Has anyone offered you a, a, a citizenship for Indonesia? <laughs> no, they have not. No, they have not. Um, but let me remind you now, we, uh, we've got about 15 minutes okay. to cover a whole bunch of other subjects right. here, shall we? Right. You, you edit yourself if you need to. I will try. So shall we go to, why did you write this book? Well, I thought it was important um, for people Again, in my opinion, energy is a frequently discussed but poorly understood topic. Sure. So when people talk about the oil companies, they think of ExxonMobil and Chevron and Royal Dutch Shell and British Petroleum. But the reality is when the energy crisis hit in the 70s in the United States, although the large oil companies did contribute, it really, what people don't realize is there are thousands of companies around the world, small companies, primarily in the United States, that were able to drive the exploration program and find new reserves. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about all the effort that the smaller companies did to basically turn an oil, critical oil shortage, into an oil glut. Uh, and it also describes the impact on the industry when we went from uh, shortage to a glut where literally within, between 1980 and 1985, the number of people in the industry was cut in half because the price of oil went from 38 to 8, and so companies literally either disappeared or let go half or more of their staff. What an impact it must have been, huh? It was. I worked for one company, and in 1983, they had 1,400 geologists, geophysicists, and petrophysicists, uh, all in oil and gas exploration operations around the world. Uh, in 1995, they had 77. Wow. Okay. So, yes, and so the devastation on their families and their careers was formidable. Uh, the other reasons was uh, to talk, I wrote the book, was to talk about um, why America should develop a viable energy, proactive energy policy, not a reactive policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I honestly don't think we've had a real energy policy since maybe during the Second World War. That everything else has been very reactive. Um, and also the importance of moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Mm. Okay. You're kind of biased in that regard, aren't you? Yes, I am. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's why you wrote the book, huh? That's right. Now, next we should talk about mm. what, what makes you uniquely qualified to write this book. You've said a little about <coughs> that, but... You right. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I think the other, not only my academic background, but I spent 40 years working with both large multinational companies. Mobile actually worked for Mobile twice, Exxon Mobile twice, Conoco, and another 20, I uh, spent 20 years with them, and another 20 years with small independents like Forest Oil, which was in Midland, Texas, Oklahoma City, and Calgary, Huffco, which was in Indonesia and Houston and Turkey, Apache in the Gulf of Mexico, Murphy in Malaysia, Houston, Australia, and CCED, which is a company that is in construction, but also in oil and gas in Oman. Um, so I have seen the world with these companies. Uh, I've worked with privately held companies. I've worked with large companies, small dynamic companies. And now I'm a principal in my consulting company, uh, J.O. Kerfoot Energy Services. And Working with these companies, I've developed experience and I hope expertise in geophysics, geology, economics, and risk analysis. And pr I think it provides me with a unique insight and it also helps me in the blog that I do, um, Our Energy Conundrum, at uh, my website. If we had another half an hour or so, I would like to quiz you about the deep water horizon. I've okay. seen that three times. Yes. <laughs> Any comment about it? Uh, Initially, there were several people that were initially indicted, um, and th the charges were dropped. Uh, I think that they, in my mind, there was clearly um, horrendous failure that took place, um, and uh, I think people uh, should have been uh, prosecuted for uh, criminal cr activities, crimes that were involved with the. Uh, that bad, huh? Uh, yes. Mm. So, you're uniquely qualified to write this book, and what difference, differentiates your book from similar books that are available on the market? Well, I touched on this before in the fact that the vast majority of, like I said, of the, the 30 books I looked at were the best sellers at the time of the last year on energy. And like I said, the, those 
overwhelming majority of authors were journalists, not to uh, yeah. condemn a, a journalist. Uh, I'm sure their writing skills are far more polished than mine, but uh, their yeah. ability, to, the insight into the industry and the the workings in the organization, the inner workings of the organization, if you want, I pull back the curtain. And uh, as a journalist, they're never going to see anything but the curtain. <laughs> All right, now, it, who, who will benefit from reading this book? Okay. What's the population that would benefit? Well, I think anyone that wants to really understand the energy crisis in the 70s, and I, real, I would say really would, would be understand the energy industry, I think would benefit from this. I mean, there's some interesting stories about the high-stake gambles of, of the defined oil. There's a high risk, uh, high capital investment. You, can, you may drill wells that may cost $200, $300 million, and the chance of success may be only 25 or 30 percent. Uh, and I talk about the gambles in the U.S., Canada, Indonesia, West Africa, the North Sea, Malaysia, Australia, Middle East. Um, corruption in Southeast Asia, I've already given one example in uh, the case between uh, how a gentleman was able to um, amass a wealth. Well, I'm sorry, the, there was a, in 1980, when my wife and I were going to Indonesia for the first time, um, there was a court case between Indonesia and the Singaporean government to, to determine where the probate of a gentleman who was an Indonesian citizen who had just passed away but was living in uh, Singapore at the time. And his highest salary that he ever had within Pertamina, and he rose to the rank of the number two in Pertamina, the Standard Oil Company, was $5,000 a year. That was the most he ever made. Mm. And yet when he died, he had massed a wealth of over $25 million in savings accounts, plus multi-million dollars of properties around Singapore. And they did an interview in the English uh, new, uh, news station, TV station in Singapore with his wife. And they said, can you please explain how your husband was able to amass the wealth of millions and millions of dollars and he never earned more than $5,000 a year? And in a very straight face, very calm response, she looks into the camera and says, he was a very frugal man. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> there, there's a definition right. of frugality. That's huh? right. And I think it's fair to say in my book I talk about several very frugal men. Uh, mm -hmm. The impact of the oil price volatility uh, and not only the price on the consumer who sees the oil prices go up and go down, but then when the oil prices go down, the massive layoffs that occur, oh. the, uh, the technical blunders and there was one company, a large company, a major company that actually went out and shot a $30 million high technical seismic survey in eastern Indonesia. Um, but they made a slight blunder and they didn't do the proper surveying work and so they shot this $30 million survey in the wrong block. Okay, they, and so actually they shot it in the block, my company's block. Uh, so I was quite happy to receive that data. So we talk about these, some of these technical blunders. And some of the successes, the spectacular successes. I went to work I uh, went to Malaysia with a company that had picked up two blocks from uh, that had been released by Royal Dutch Shell, who said there's nothing left mm -hmm. in these blocks. And the company had also picked up two blocks in the deep water, uh, ultra deep water of What's Malaysia. What's the block? Uh, it is basically gives you an offshore area. It's a coordinates of a block, okay. and it gives you the uh, the right to explore for oil and gas. Okay. And you sign the agreement with the government of Malaysia in this case. Uh, and then the agreement is typically the government gets 80, if you have success, the government gets 85% of the profits and then the company gets 15%. Um, and if you don't have success, you get to pay all the costs yourself. So the company I was with had picked up these blocks in the deep water uh, and people thought they had been saying Exxon and Royal Dutch Shell, the largest owners, uh, producers in the country, said there's nothing left in these blocks. There's nothing left in the blocks that left uh, in the blocks that just picked up, <coughs> and there's really nothing left in Malaysia at all. New reserves left in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, five years later, the company I was with was the largest producer of oil and gas in Malaysia, passing Exxon Mobil and uh, Royal Dutch Shell, with discoveries not in the block, not only in the blocks that had been released by Shell, but also in the deep water blocks that had been. Uh, 
assessed to have no potential by rolled at shell either. So those were the spectacular successes from that standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> who will benefit from reading this book? And now, what will be, who will be interested in reading this book? We talked about that, didn't we? Well, I think it's about not just the oil and gas industry, but to understand the driving forces behind energy. Why is nuclear and coal uh, demand gone up? Why has it gone down? Um, what's caused the dramatic rise uh, in demand for wind farms and for solar parks? Uh, and what is the future uh, for energy in this country? What about global warming and climate change? Does that play into what we're talking about now? Well, it does, uh, but you know, it's, um, the, the question is how do you build consensus? And you can try polarization, and that do usually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and if we think about major changes that have occurred through time, there's typically, there is usually a tipping point when a certain group decides to join a movement to cause their, to cause dramatic change, whether it's the end of the Vietnam War or civil rights. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is, is to talk, talk to the issues on renewable energy, not only on economics, but also to recognize there's a finite amount of uh, oil and gas, fossil fuel left, but also recognize the importance of, cl of, of global warming, which will cause, uh, I believe, uh, climate change. We have to realize that it's science, so it's not an absolute number. I can't say on March 17, 2077, we will see a 2% increase, or a two degree increase in climate. Uh, we can make projections, we can make models, but there's a lot of uncertainty in that. Of course. So people that may push back on that will sometimes move to the, through the importance of renewable energy because they do recognize uh, that fossil fuel is not a renewable resource. And at some point in time, we will run out of inexpensive fossil fuel. Well, I'm terribly concerned about global warming and all the related effects because I, I think it was yesterday I saw on the news about, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the organization, but a fully credible organization that says, if we don't do something pretty dramatic within 10 or 11 years, we will reach that point where it's practically irreversible, yeah. beyond just the uh, polar ice melting and those kinds of things. And, and again, what, and again, some people will you know say it's false science, but my my response to that usually is, uh, the steamship companies of the world really didn't worry about icebergs until the Titanic, uh, and let's not wait for the Titanic or wait for that iceberg, because it, then it is too late. Are you sure you're not too partisan in, in pushing for renewable energy and just abandoning uh, re those kinds of energies we've been using for so many years? Well, I think it's important to realize that change is not going to happen. I think what you've got to do is make, put priorities in place. And to do that, you, t the, the greatest cause for um, greenhouse gases right now is coal. So the main thing is to make the move away from coal. And actually, the utilities are doing that right now. They're abandoning coal. Uh, quite quickly because quite candidly in many cases it's economics but also it's also about uh, ec the uh, uh, greenhouse gases as well. So that's the first step. And the next step, and I expect we're going to see that happen, st dramatic changes by between 2025 and 2030 is a move from combustion engines uh, to electric vehicles. Electric vehicles? Th that soon? Uh, there is a professor out of Stanford that would say the tipping point will be 2025. We've now got EVs that can travel up to 300 miles uh, before they need a charge. The fast charging stations now uh, can get a charge that can get a vehicle another 125 miles in under eight minutes. Um, but what we need is some leadership relative to um, major changes. Like for instance, if you wanted to basically put charging stations across the United States, all it would take would be a tax credit to s put uh, those charging stations in there. And the gasoline stations would be the first ones to do it. What people don't realize is they've already got the asset paid for in the land. Mm -hmm. And their margin is not from the sale of gasoline. They make less than a penny a gallon on the sale of gasoline. Where they make their money is the sale of the drinks, and the beef jerky and the <laughs> snacks inside. So if it's an extra couple of minutes to, to charge that vehicle, 
that's just dollars and cents going in their pockets. And so the move would be very quick, and the, it would be very cost effective. The elephant and, in the room, leadership. Yes, is it, it is. national le leadership or leadership around the world? It's leadership around the world. It's leadership in the city. It's leadership in uh, the state. It's leadership at the federal level, and it's leadership around the world, yes. Well, we're going to run out of time before it's necessary. So anyhow, we need to stop now. I and understand. you can look at the camera All right. and tell the viewers what you need to tell them about what we talked about, anything else on your mind. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the importance of renewable energy. And I appreciate the opportunity to put forward the argument that the United States should develop a proactive energy policy uh, that provides renewable, sustainable, cost-effective energy uh, for our country. And renewable energy not only does that, but it also creates jobs, high-quality jobs for our country. So from my standpoint, that's an important issue that needs to be carried throughout your audience. Thank you so very, okay. very much. Very good. And as uh, <laughs> present, I'll give you actually a published book, so you won't have to carry around this 12-pound binder. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you very so much, very Tom. much. Oh, it's you. been wonderful, wonderful. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this interview as much Absolutely. as I have. Yeah. Absolutely. And we will have you back on again before long because I'm sure you've got other things that you want to talk about. And, and now the countdown clock says we've got, okay, to watch my shows on the web, Google, Don, Bam, YouTube. There's other shows almost as interesting as uh, this one. And uh, to learn more about humanists and humanism, because I'm a humanist, and forgive me, go to www.americanhumanist.org to learn about more about humanism and to, to learn more about the Alliance for Democracy, an organization I belong to, go to the national website at the AllianceForDemocracy.org. Oh, and the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, without the ACLU, I don't know where we'd be without our civil liberties being protected as, as much as they are. And thanks for watching. And remember, remember KFC. Matt Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too. And you too. <laughs> and you too. And you too. <laughs> so thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.